And the first sponsor for this is obviously Green Energy Ohio. It's a nonprofit. It's an advocate for all kinds of clean energy. So, and um, Green Energy has been around a long time. Um, we also have Napa Auto Parts, which you know is here, the one on Tyler. Um, so if you have any needs, um, any kind of electrical needs, um, parts, they're wonderful and they've sponsored and they've sponsored before. We have Bright Innovations, which is a company that has R&D at their site for electric batteries and um, any of the upcoming Lake Tran, obviously, you know they have an electric bus that was supposed to be here, but we know that things don't always happen as it should, but it's coming this week. So it's wonderful. It's going to be quiet. It's not going to be idling, and that's a start. Um, also, NOPEC, which is an alternative for your supplier for your energy. Um, it's clean, and it's normally better cost effective. We have Zips Racing. Um, I'm not as familiar, so maybe Jane can mention that. Lakeland Community College, they're letting us use their parking lot. They also have classes that we'll be teaching for alternative energy, new jobs, new technology. We have Sarda, obviously, for the bus. Greenwood Chevrolet, um, Jane, you can speak on them. No. We have Shaker Heights. So Shaker Heights, the city itself, is going green. It's going alternative energy. Um, they're very much advocates open to any kind of solar or electric cars. Um, they have churches that already have uh, solar canopies. Southeast Harley, you guys probably know, they're working on an electric bike. Although much to all of our chagrin or my chagrin, um, they're quiet and you know, hardly people like loud. So they, they're actually putting something in to give you that feel. Although I like the quiet noise um, and Ohio fuel cell, obviously that's part of the R&D for new battery technology, which is huge. Um, and now here's Jane, she's the director of Green Energy Ohio. Thanks for coming. I want to thank all of you for being here, and I apologize for being a little late. We were coming from our first event, which was, as, as Valerie mentioned, in Shaker Heights. Um, so much is going on in Northeast Ohio. It is, this is fantastic. Um, about 20 years ago, Green Energy Ohio began to have an annual solar tour. And people could go to um, their neighborhoods, you know, friends, and see solar panels when they were still a novelty in some ways. And there wasn't a lot of information. So fast forward to 2021, and electric vehicles are basically the solar panels of 20 years ago. They aren't a novelty, but they certainly haven't been, they aren't as, as uh, visible everywhere yet. Um, so we decided this year we would focus on electric vehicles. And not just the vehicles themselves, but also all of the various uh, systems and processes, the infrastructure that is so necessary to avoid range anxiety. Um, I'm driving an electric vehicle on this tour, and I can tell you I experienced some range anxiety already. Um, but thanks to NOPEC, one of our great sponsors, I have been able to find locations to charge my, uh, my Polestar. Please check it out. The Polestar is, the, is a Swedish car. It's the Volvo entry into the EV market. Um, we also wanted to look at issues like workforce training and the ability of people at places like Lakeland Community College to learn the skills that will be necessary for the clean energy economy, not just EVs, but also different forms of renewable energy. Um, we wanted to you know, educate people on all of these things. Um, the, the production, the development, and the adoption of EVs has been nothing less than miraculous. And to prove that point, last month, the Vatican announced that the Pope has um, entered into an agreement to buy a, a Fisker Ocean, which is actually, uh, I've looked at it online, it will be a pretty cool car and an even better Pope mobile. So, um, you know, I think we will see nothing but um, advancement in this area. I have to thank our volunteers. We had the best committee. Um, EV enthusiasts are 
true believers. They are committed. They are, there's a reason why they're called enthusiasts. And Tom and Valerie, of course, Tom and Valerie have been the bedrock of the Northeast Ohio tours, uh, green energy tours, for m probably as many years as we've had the tour. And they stepped up right away, and I can't say enough about them. And I understand that Valerie may have a, a new consulting, solar consulting, doing some work. So if you are interested in solar, I would stop by and talk to Valerie about that. She certainly, she has worked for a number of solar companies, and she certainly is very knowledgeable on that. Um, we want to be advocates. We want to to hear and see and learn so that we can talk to policymakers about the EV agenda. Um, it is so important that we make the point that we need money for infrastructure. We need, um, we need R&D. We need so much. There, the government can help. The private sector is doing an amazing job. You know, the, the electric Jeep is being produced in Toledo. Um, the, uh, we have the facilities in Warren that we will be visiting later today where they are producing the pickup truck. Um, but we just need a lot more. And that kind of exposure is what we wanted to do uh, with this tour. So again, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce, um, I call him my co-conspirator. Uh, Scott Miller is a GEO board member who um, some time ago I asked if he wanted to be uh, an officer on the board, and he didn't think he had enough time to do that, but he said, I'd like to work on this tour, and I think he may be regretting that decision because the time commitment has been amazing. He has gone above and beyond what any board member has done, and, um, and it is, we really have, uh, I really have relied very heavily on Scott, and I thank you. And I, if, if you would like to come up and say a few words. Well, th thank you, Jane, and thank you all for coming out today. I, I have no regrets in, in helping to lead this effort, um, that the effort really would not, this would not have occurred without the time and commitment from folks like Tom and Valerie and the other members of the planning committee, some, of, some others of whom are with us today. And we want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, you know, Green Energy Ohio's uh, mission is to transition the state of Ohio to a clean energy future. Uh, we really feel like that also includes um, vibrant communities, a vibrant economy, and clean and healthy, a clean and healthy environment. And uh, one of the things that when Jane and I were talking about this tour almost a year ago and, and the switch from the solar tour to something else, I offered her the opportunity to talk about electric vehicles because while it is a very small part of the overall vehicle market at the moment, it is the fastest growing segment of the automobile market. And we, I think the folks in this room and the folks on, online and the GEO board members certainly all understand that when we talk about um, the transition to, to clean energy, that transportation has to play a large part of that. And so those of you who are playing your role and stepping up in this transition, we really appreciate that work. And as Jane mentioned, this tour is designed to lift up that story. So on behalf of the Board of Directors of Green Energy Ohio, I want to thank all of you for coming out today. I want to thank those of you who support Green Energy Ohio. If you are not already, um, this is my shameless plug that you should become a member of Green Energy Ohio. We would love to have you. We are a membership-based organization. Memberships help carry out, help us carry out our mission. Uh, they fund us, but also they drive our, our, our engagement. And so uh, if you are not already, please join G Green Energy Ohio. And with that, Jane or Tom, who am I turning things over to? Tom? Okay. Come on up here. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. So you get to listen to me again briefly. Um, I'm going to read something because I don't speak on the fly as well as many people. Uh, I was first exposed to electric vehicles when I worked at a golf course as a teenager, and I learned to service the golf carts. In the early 1990s, I was so frustrated that I couldn't buy an electric car that I set out to make my own by converting that little yellow Honda you see out there. Um, and I was not alone. Uh, Dale, Tan Dale Terdan, uh, Bruce Roberts, Greg Shea, who's right here, 
Um, just to name a few, in this area, took it upon ourselves to make conversions because we knew uh, it, was, it would make a better set of wheels. The electric motor is in so many ways the absolute best way to propel a vehicle. It's clean, efficient, inexpensive, reliable, lots of torque, and no idling. Uh, this technology uh, to build our electric cars today actually existed over 30 years ago. The only missing component was the batteries, and battery technology lagged because we never invested the time or resources to make that happen. After all, the oil companies had plenty of gasoline to sell us, the auto companies wanted to keep us driving cars that needed lots of maintenance and needed lots of parts, and the politicians mostly just followed the money. But now there's no stopping this revolution. Uh, yes, I'm sad when I think of what we, we could all be driving electric cars right now, but I'm truly excited to see the future coming on faster than ever. We're going to completely transition our transportation systems in the next decades. Our electric cars will last more miles, use less energy, pollute less. The battery, te battery technology will continue to improve, give them more range and quicker charging times, and charging stations already are starting to pop up everywhere. So more and more of us will charge our cars free, with electricity from our rooftop solar panels. And if we have a power outage, we will backfeed our house from the car to keep the house going. And that's the future we see. And if you want to stick around for the rally, we'll illustrate that at the solar house out here and give you some examples and describe how that all is going to work. Um, but the EV is coming for you. It's not just coming for your car. It's coming for our trucks, and it's coming for our buses. And I'm proud to have learned that Lake County is taking a leading role in making that transition thanks to Lakeland, Lake, thanks to Lake Tran. So with that, let me turn it over to Lake Tran CEO, Ben Capel. Thank you, Ben. Well, hello, thank you for having me here. I'm Ben Capel, I'm CEO of Lake Tran. Um, so, uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, Lake Tran has some electric buses that should be here any day now. Um, we began the journey towards electric buses in 2018. Um, so everything in our world takes a long time because everything is sort of custom made. So uh, we started off by getting some grants from the federal government. Um, just like this building, a lot of the things Lake Tran does is paid for with grant money. So 80% of most of the things we buy is funded by someone else. So we get grants from the federal government. Most of the time, state of Ohio, um, there's an organization called NOACA. So you know, this building, 20% 20, 20 of it was paid by for Lake Tran, 20% of it, or 80% of it was paid for by someone else. Um, the same is true with the buses. So we got grant money in 2018 and ordered our buses uh, in 2019. So we have 10 electric buses on order. They should be all delivered by the end of August. Um, they're pretty exciting. So we're doing something that's a little unique in the transit world, which is called on-route charging. So there's two ways, unlike your car, there's kind of two ways to run a bus. One, you can charge in your garage overnight. It can drive around all day. When it gets back, it charges again, sort of like what you would do with your car. The other model is called on-route charging, where the bus has a smaller battery, but it gets charged at locations throughout the day. So this facility was built to do that. So if you look in the roof outside where the buses stop, there are two big red arms, basically, called panographs. Those are essentially a robotic arm, and when the battery electric bus pulls up, that arm will come down from the roof and con connect to the top of the bus and give it what we refer to as a rapid charge. So uh, we'll have the, the charging room open a little bit later, and you can actually see the pieces of equipment that, that convert the energy to the, the energy for the bus. But they are 450 kilowatt chargers. They run about 800 amps. It's a very powerful charger. Um, we always joke that we don't want to get a squirrel in between there, or we get a fried squirrel. <laughs> um, <laughs> so instead of the bus charging at home every day, it charges on the route about every hour. So in theory, our buses could run indefinitely because they don't have to charge overnight. They get their energy in about five minutes, stopping at this facility and other facilities throughout Lake County. We're one of the only transit systems doing that. It's a very different model. Um, there's a lot of reasons we do that. You know, Lake Tran is funded by the taxpayers of Lake County, so everything we do needs to be as cost effective as possible. So I always joke that I'll run a bus on anything as long as it's the cheapest possible thing I can run it on. Um, all of you probably already know that, you know, Fueling an electric vehicle is much cheaper than fueling a fossil fuel vehicle. That's true for buses also. So the reason we're doing this is first, 
for, for cost effectiveness. You know, we need to run that bus as cheap as possible. Um, second, noise pollution is a big deal in the transit world. You know, when buses are sitting here, you know, we can have four or five buses sitting here at a time with all of those idling. It's difficult to hear. If you need to ask a question about where to go, you can't hear what, what needs to be said. And especially if you have any kind of disability, that's even harder. So noise pollution is a big part of it, and obviously air pollution. Um, you know, these buses are, are diesel engines, so they're, you know, they're as clean as they can be, but we could do better. <laughs> um, so we're very excited. We'll have 10 out of our 17 buses will be electric, which is a pretty big chunk all at once. Um, one of the nice things when you think, talk, talk about infrastructure for an on-route charging bus is the infrastructure that we use for this location is all sort of off-the-shelf electrical parts from, from First Energy. We don't have to buy all kinds of crazy expensive custom electrical parts to charge all our buses in the garage. So if you think about it, there's a lot of energy that needs to charge a bus. So when you put all that energy in the garage, you have to get, you know, you have to step up to kind of custom made electrical solutions. The stuff that we bought here, you know, these are transformers that First Energy has. They come, they put them in, keeps the infrastructure costs low. So on top of keeping infrastructure costs low, we spread that charging demand out throughout the electrical grid. You don't have to do major electrical, electrical grid improvements either. And also, you know, redundancy. So if, if power goes out, people still need to use the bus. So by having those chargers spread out throughout Lake County, you know, if one piece of power goes down, we can still charge at other locations. So when we designed our system, we designed it for all those reasons, you know, to keep costs low was number one. Um, but also to be redundant and reliable was number two. So we wish we'd had a bus for you here today. Um, unfortunately, we don't. <laughs> but um, they should be here. It, it could be here this week. Um, it was a little delayed due to COVID. There was a special high voltage cable that came from Italy that uh, the bus was sitting at the bus plant for quite a while waiting for that cable. Um, one of the other nice things about what we do is everything we do is required to be built in the United States. There's a percentage of materials we have to meet that are U.S. So all these buses are a minimum of 80% um, American components. So on our electric buses, they have, they have American batteries, they have you know, American steel, and they're very much a, a product of this country. They're made in Anniston, Alabama um, by a company called New Flyer. So we are very excited to get them. Um, one of the things that's interesting, when you talk about buying an electric vehicle versus buying a gasoline vehicle, there's a lot of times the price difference is not huge. Sometimes, depending on your options, it can be similar. For a bus, the price difference is very large. So a diesel bus is about $550,000, the ones you see driving out here. Um, an electric bus is about $835,000. So they are significantly more expensive up front, but they are cheaper to operate in the long run. So for us, they still will actually save us about $5 million over their 12 year life. So on top of them being you know, clean and green and all those great things, they also save the taxpayers money, which is very important to us being a, a government agency. So um, we're very happy to have you here today. Um, we have multiple staff around to be able to answer your questions as you kind of look at the building. Um, we'll open up the charging area so you can actually see the charging cabinets. Um, and just, you know, thank you for having us and we really appreciate it. And we're really excited to be part of, you know, the electric future of Ohio. <laughs> if anyone has any questions though, I will answer them. Sure. Sure. So the grant money, Lake, one of the things that Lake Tran is always doing is looking for grant money from other sources. Um, so the grant money for the buses came from a number of different places. One of them was the VW Trust Fund after, well, I think most people are aware of the lawsuit that happened with VW. Um, we got some other grants from the Ohio EPA. Um, with the Federal Transit Administration, there is a large grant called LONO, which stands for, you know, low or no emissions vehicles. So we got a large amount of money from that. And then we also got some grant money from the Northeast Ohio uh, Coordinating Agency, which is our regional planning organization. So there's a lot of money from a lot of places in the buses and the facilities. Um, for longevity, so everything we buy, because we buy it with grant money, there are rules that come with it. So every bus we own has a minimum number of years we have to operate it for. So the, big, the bigger buses, just like that one sitting over there, we're required by federal regulation to, to keep those for 12 years. 
We usually keep them for about 15, but those buses have to actually be certified by an agency with the feds that they will last that long. So the battery electric buses are certified in the same program as the diesel buses, so they are certified they will last 12 years. So um, everything we do has a regulation that goes with it, but um, that one's great because we know, we know an electric bus will last just as long as a diesel bus. Thank you. Sure. You said that over the course of life you're going to save approximately five million dollars. Is that for that per bus, or is that for the? No, that's that's for the fleet of buses. Okay, and you're purchasing how many? Ten. Ten. So about five hundred thousand for a twelve-year period of time per bus. Yes. And most of that savings comes from. The savings is generally from um, maintenance and fuel, or well, you know, electricity. Maintenance is a big deal on a, on a transit bus. Um, we spend a lot of money keeping it in good shape. Um, having less components is a big deal. But the other thing is, you know, on a diesel bus, everything runs off the diesel engine. So it's all tied to it somehow, and it's all very close together. It gets very hot back there. For an electric bus, you can disperse those components throughout the bus and enable them to be designed a little more efficiently than on a diesel bus. So just the way you build it makes a difference. You know, all of the HVAC components can be on the roof where they can dissipate heat versus being part of them in the engine compartment. So part of how it's built also makes it cheaper to operate. So one of the savings that I don't hear people talk about, and I know from personal experience, is the braking. Um, with the electric vehicle, you can I drive a Volt. I hardly ever have to use my brake pedal. Sure. Um, so the cost of changing brakes on a bus versus a car is probably eight times or ten times. Yeah, when we do a full brake job on all four wheels, it takes about two days, and it's about an eight thousand dollar job. So it, it is significant when you when you can save just one brake job. Thank you. <laughs> sure. We are not 100% sure. Most of what's going on in the transit industry started in around 2012, so um, we don't have as much data about that yet, but the data we do have is that the batteries have vastly outperformed expectations. So originally, the companies would tell us, you'll get seven years out of a set of batteries. Well, now they tell us nine, and they continue to kind of push that envelope and push that warranty out. So. A part of it has to do with if we keep them in the right charging range all the time, um, we'll reduce that cost. And all of our uh, infrastructure is, is kind of electronically controlled to keep the battery in that range. So we don't think we'll have to do a full battery replacement in the life of the vehicle. One of the nice things about the version we bought is the battery cells are, are kind of hot swappable. So our mechanics can, if we have a, a cell go bad, a mechanic can get on the roof of the bus, he can pull that cell out, put a new one in, and you're, you're good to go. So you're not doing a full pack replacement because you have a, a part of the battery fail. So we think we'll probably be doing maintenance the whole time, but not a full battery out, battery in kind of scenario. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Ben mentioned about where he gets some of the grants for the buses. Uh, he mentioned NOACA, and that's why when I was commissioner, we made sure we gave NOACA, or we gave Lake Tran a seat on the governing board. So uh, uh, <clears throat> you're able to kind of get first uh, dibs at some of that uh, transit grant money. Comes from the federal government. Unfortunately, the state government is not as generous uh, uh, to the uh, transit industry and, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, what we really need to do with the future you know the problem today and I, I serve in the state government I've served in the county government I served in the state government before uh, the difference today is that uh, uh, people don't really pay much attention to facts or they make up their own facts and uh, I don't know if anybody watched 60 minutes last night David Attenborough you know talked about uh, you know the, the the real challenge of climate change you know I serve in the state legislature which is a diverse body made up of representatives throughout the state of Ohio. And unfortunately, we have our share of climate change deniers uh, as members of the state legislature. And I think it's, it's just so important 
that we all understand the facts uh, the you know the future of our world that uh, if, if we don't move from fossil fuels uh, you know and, and really uh, move into uh, alternative forms of energy that are renewable uh, we're gonna have problems so I want to salute all of you out here today support of electronic vehicles electric vehicles uh, uh, certainly uh, you know the, the state needs to uh, accommodate uh, this advanced technology one of the things the state did before I got down there was they put an annual fee onto hybrid or electronic vehicles uh, which really was kind of the argument well they got to pay their fair share for driving on the roads and all that fortunately unlike the gas tax which is based on how much usage you have this is a flat fee uh, no matter how often you move this vehicle now uh, we tried to remove that fee during the budget process I'm on the Finance Committee we offered amendment in the Finance Committee but like every other Democratic amendment that got uh, offered in the uh, Budget uh, Finance Committee, it was tabled uh, by the majority party. But I think it's something, you know, we're, we're going to continue to press and, and realize that, uh, you know, we, we, we want to incentivize uh, alternative energy. The last thing we want to do is de-incentivize it uh, by some of these fees and all that. So. You know, we, we need better policies in the state of Ohio on all of these things, uh, you know, encouraging solar and wind power. You know, I think the thing we really need to invest research in is, uh, you know, how do we store some of this energy? The big problem right now is, you know, we can generate it with wind power, we can generate it with solar power, but it's being able to store that. And I think that is really where research has got to step up, and, and I think that will, that will solve a lot of long-range problems in our society. You know, there, there's some positive signs, uh, you know, in Columbus. Uh, when you go into the state underground garage, which is underneath the state house, there are electric charging stations uh, in the, in the uh, underground uh, garage. Uh, so there is a recognition uh, that we need to accommodate those vehicles and more of them. Uh, there's also some troubling signs in the state legislature. Uh, uh, there's a bill right now going through the Ways and Earth to Public Utilities Committee, which I serve on, uh, that basically would allow allow uh, townships uh, the ability to referendum windmills and and solar farms uh, uh, you know and basically to be able to put these on the ballot and have the people vote and say we don't want these things uh, so that's a troubling uh, uh, movement you know we're trying to stop that bill in, in committee and all that uh, but uh, you know, I, I guess how progressive can Ohio really be regarded, you know, when we pulled renewable incentives out of our energy policy, which were enacted back in 2007, and replaced that with subsidies for two coal-fired plants, uh, you know, which, which really, you know, is going backwards in terms of where public policy should be. So, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, and we all know what happened with, with, with House Bill 6, uh, which was the, the, the move to allegedly save the nuclear power plant to give them a, a bailout, which I'm now saying we don't want the money. Uh, but in order to get the votes for that, they stuck uh, a, 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 a rejection of the renewable incentives and added the coal fire thing. So, you know, we're still trying to work on, on, on getting that, that mess cleaned up, which, which I inherited when I came down there in January. Uh, but I, I think the one thing that really we try and emphasize, and I try and emphasize with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, is the economic benefit of moving in these particular directions. There are hundreds of manufacturers in the state of Ohio where we're already creating a lot of jobs and creating a lot of uh, technologies to, to create uh, alternative energy, whether it's in vehicles, whether it's through other things and all that. And, and we really, you know, we really need to encourage that. I mean, we really, we really need to understand that there is a, a, and I think President Biden has said this too, there is, there is just a great future economically in dealing with climate change and coming up with alternative forms of energy and all that. I mean, and, and we really need to invest in that. I mean, I get I get a little upset when I see the federal government gives gives fossil fuel companies a tax break for the exploration they do to find more oil. You know, in other words, whatever they spend on trying to find more oil, they get a tax break for that. You know, we should we should really ramp up the tax breaks for uh, what really is the future of that. So I guess you know, I I think what we need 
to do is, is try and, and, and change the reputation of Ohio. We have never had a great reputation as being a regressive state. We don't invest in mass transit like other states do. We need to do that. And I also think, uh, you know, that we need to start dealing with facts. You know, uh, uh, you know state energy policy from this point on has got to be based on facts. The facts that climate change is real, uh, that, that we are putting the next generation in jeopardy of, 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 of a lack of oxygen in this globe, uh, a lot of pollution, uh, you know, and, and people have, in this history, the citizens of Ohio have stepped up to the plate over the years. They stepped up to clean up Lake Erie. They, they, they basically said, we will pay for a t primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment of wastewater uh, to clean up our lake. You know, the people, you know, the people of Ohio, I think, want change in terms of sounder energy policies, more electric vehicles and all that. We just got to get their representatives in the state legislature to follow the will of the people. So I think it's very important that you as citizens and everybody you know speak up. Speak up to your legislature. Say, this is what we want. You know, we, we, we need energy policy that's based on facts, based on protecting our future. We don't need energy policy that's bought and sold by the special interests, which unfortunately has happened too often in Columbus. So thank you for all you're doing. And I guess, I don't know, if or, but Tom's in charge here, so I don't want to, I don't want to hold up the train. And, and Julie, Julie and Ben have been trying to get me out here to, to tour this uh, transit facility. So I'm here today. So, okay. Thanks for coming, Dan. Thanks. So Dan's going to stick around and Ben's going to be around to answer any questions, you guys. Uh, we're, we're, many people brought cars and they're willing to give you uh, test drives. I think, is a dealer showed up? We've got a couple of dealers. Okay. Um, and, and so there's a, a lot of the people, friends of mine especially, that brought their cars, might be willing to take you for a ride. We've got a little drive area up there, which I see people have parked in, and I was hoping they wouldn't. But um, So let's uh, come outside, if you can. And we're, we're gonna, I'm going to do a talk at the solar house real briefly here to describe the whole thing of connecting solar to electric cars. You have something? Okay. Valerie's got one more thing before you just... Because I'm a talker. So um, there is organic snacks here, and I hope you consider organic. Besides all the cost savings, there's external costs for cleanup if we're using chemicals, chemical runoff, same with electric. It all will cost you. You just don't see it directly in your bills. So we support organic um, and help yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.